Um, welcome to HP Connects, everyone. Our first webinar, uh, webinar series with Susan Shelby. It's a, an opportunity for us to learn and uh, have a start a conversation. So today, our conversation, as I mentioned, is with Susan Shelby. She's the president and CEO of Rhino PR. Um, before I give Susan the mic, I just want to make sure you all know that um, there's an icon that, because this webinar is supposed to be interactive, there's an icon at the bottom of your Zoom. You, those of you um, that have Zoomed before know it, it says Q&A. So if you have questions throughout the PowerPoint, go ahead and just ask your question and I'll um, bring it to Susan's attention so she can answer it throughout the PowerPoint. And then at the end, we'll unmute everyone so we can have an open discussion and hopefully uh, you guys can stick around. We also have a little fun game that we'll play with Susan. <laughs> and stay for the full hour. So um, I also want to say um, um, special thanks to today's webinar, which is Smith Group. Um, it's an architectural and engineering firm whose Boston office culture is guided by one key rule, and that's that people matter. So you can visit them at smithgroup.com. Um, and I think that's it. Uh, let's, I'll hand it over to you, Susan. Thank you. All right, thank you. Well, we gave you all a little laugh today as we were trying to figure this out. So um, this is the first of many conversations Anastasia is going to be having. Um, so we're just working out the kinks for her. That's, that's our story, and we're sticking to it. Um, so um, I am going to um, share my screen and bring up a PowerPoint presentation. Um, but as Anastasia said, please interrupt to ask questions. We want this to be as interactive as possible. There are two parts to the presentation, and if we don't get to the second part of the presentation, that is fine. We would rather answer all of your questions and make sure that you are leaving um, with, um, with something. Um, and Anastasia, we're having another technical difficulty that I cannot share my screen. <laughs> okay. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna start a little bit while somebody else figures out the PowerPoint. Um, okay. It's, uh, it's, we don't want to kill you with PowerPoint anyway, so I can always just talk. Um, anyone who knows me knows I love to talk about PR, so I'm happy to do that today. Um, so what we wanted to talk about today was, um, I've had a number of clients and then just friends who have been asking me um, during COVID, during coronavirus, during this lockdown, what should we be doing from a public relations standpoint? Um, should we just stop everything? Should we still be putting out press releases? Um, should we still be pitching the press stories, even if they aren't related to COVID? And so Anastasia and I started talking, and that's where we came up with um, this idea um, to talk about, uh, give you some tips and tricks for um, 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 working with the press. So the first thing I want to mention is that I know we've all been hearing um, you know, this is the first time in 100 years we've had a pandemic like this. Um, this is a very unusual moment from a public relations and a communications standpoint, because this is the very first time that we've had a crisis of this magnitude. It's a global crisis during the age of social media. So 24-7 news cycle, social media, um, the news is not controlled by the press anymore. We can all self-publish. We can all be out there having a conversation on social media. So it's very, very challenging from a communication standpoint. The other part about it that's unique is that the press has been sent home just like the rest of us. So I'm sure if you've been watching TV, um, you've seen Al Roker broadcasting from his dining room. Um, Gail King from the Today Show is set up a studio in her dining room or her family room or something. Um, they have to do their own hair and makeup and um, Kelly Ripa posted something about how she was raiding her daughter's closet because she was running out of things to wear and didn't want to wear the same thing every single day. So in one sense, we're all in the same boat together. Um, and so these, the press um, is trying to deal with an unprecedented situation just like the rest of us. So the main thing um, that we want to talk about today is that, yes, COVID is the main story. COVID is the number one story that is out there, but there are still other things being written about. So for example, today in the Boston Globe, I noticed that on the front page, which is COVID from top to bottom, 
there were two articles. So um, one article uh, was about the Red Sox, about the results of the inquiry into the science dealing with the Houston Astros. And then there was another article, which while technically ties into COVID, was about a bear in New Hampshire that has emerged from um, um, uh, um, hibernation with three cubs. And the reporter was talking about how it's an inspiration for the rest of us that at some point we will get through this and we will emerge from quarantine just like a bear hibernates every winter. Um, so, and then on the inside of the globe, there are more and more stories that are not directly tied to COVID. So we're seeing a bit of a shift. Um, yes, COVID is still the number one story, but there is room for other stories. And in fact, um, I did a little um, tally and since March 21st, um, on behalf of my clients, I have put out eight press releases. Only three of those were related to COVID. And they all were picked up by AEC Press, local press, um, High Profile Monthly. Um, so there are stories out there um, that they are covering. And um, one of those, um, actually, I think I forgot one, but there's one um, where a company um, promoted, uh, has a new president and CEO. Uh, other ones were about projects that were completed well before the coronavirus. Um, and so you just have to stop and think about it. And one of the things we're going to talk about today is how to stop and think about the story that you're trying to pitch and what's appropriate and what is not appropriate. So the thing that I always say is that you need to do your homework and um, know the publications that you're pitching. Um, so for example, uh, right now, national press is all about COVID. So if you have a story, you need to look locally. Um, and then it might get picked up locally, but the national reporters are completely focused on COVID at this time. Um, read the publications that you're pitching. You should know what they cover, who their audience is. This is more important now than ever because you want to be, you don't want to waste their time. You don't want to fill their inbox with something that isn't appropriate. Um, we're all stuck at home. We're all getting way too many emails. We're all on Zoom. So be cognizant of that. Figure out who is covering what at the publication. So for example, um, different publications and out media outlets have taken reporters and reassigned them. Um, think about it. In Hollywood, there are no award galas. There are no movie premieres. Um, celebrities are all stuck at home quarantining like the rest of us. So they've taken their entertainment reporters and asked them to cover different beats. And it could be that they're looking for happy stories, they're looking for good news stories, they're looking for ways that people are helping each other but news outlets are trying to reassign reporters. There are also a number of media outlets, um, large newspaper chains that have laid off staff. So make sure you check to see who is still there, who is covering what. Um, and I always recommend start with an email. Nowadays, you might have their work phone, but they're probably not in the office. And if it's not being forwarded, you're just leaving a voicemail that isn't gonna get answered. So start with an email. Um, because everyone is still getting their email, even if they're working at home. Susan, um, I'm going to let you say next slide. For some reason, we have control over it. Um, okay, so next slide. Are you ready? I'm ready. Um, so be patient. Um, number one, we're all feeling the stress. I have lost track of how many weeks we've been under quarantine here in Massachusetts, but it's been a long time. Uh, and the press is feeling the same thing. So we're all tired, we're all stressed out, none of us know what's going to happen. And also, if you think about it, if you're a reporter and you're on the front lines of covering COVID, you're even more stressed because you're, you're covering these stories right up front, um, especially on the healthcare beat. Um, they are out there talking to people, um, they're seeing firsthand how this pandemic is hitting us. So be patient and be kind, ask how they're doing. Ask if it's a good time to talk. When you send an email, um, put a little kind note in there. And um, I always start off with, I know this is a crazy time. Just wanted to share this news with you. If you need any more information, please don't hesitate to contact me. Hope you're doing well. Um, but just be cognizant of the fact that these are very unusual times. 
Um, so I pitch by email and then depending on the story, I might follow up with a phone call just to say, you know, usually a day or so later, just to say, hey, um, and this really, to be honest, is only about the stories related to COVID. Um, the other stories I know are gonna get picked up if they're interested, but if it's a something specific about COVID, I wanna make sure that they see it in their inbox. Um, I watched a webinar where they had a number of national journalists on there talking about what their day is like. And one woman who's in LA working for NBC or CBS said she had 12,000 emails in her inbox, which is why I'm saying be careful about what you're sending and make sure that it is actually relevant news for that publication. If they are interested, they will get back to you. If they don't respond, it might just not be the right time right now for a story, but they might come back to you another time when things start to calm down. Um, the other thing, as I mentioned, is we're seeing that it used to be 100% COVID, then it was 70-30, it's getting more towards 60-40, so things are going to balance out. COVID will remain a top story at least through the end of the year, at least until there is a vaccine and we see light at the end of the tunnel, but they will start covering other things. Um, the people that I feel the worst for are the sports reporters because there is nothing for them to cover right now. So thank you for Gronk for taking, going to Tampa and finishing out his contract because that at least gives us something new to listen to right now. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I know everyone has seen this here and I did not put a picture of Mr. Rogers in his cardigan because I know this has been beaten to death on social media, but um, be a helper. And this has always been my philosophy is that even if I can't help a reporter find a source with a, one of my clients as a source or one of my client being able to answer the question, I do my best to find somebody else who can be a source for that article. So for example, um, there was a reporter at the BBJ doing an article about the Paycheck Protection Program, the PPP, and wanted to talk to AEC firms who had applied for help to find out how did the process go, who was the bank they worked with, did they get the money, what were they planning to use the money for? Well, some of my clients have applied, some of them haven't. I wasn't able to get one of my clients to respond to the questions, but I was able to find her two or three other companies who had applied and either gotten it or not gotten it. So at the very least, I was providing her with some additional sources. So stop and think about what you can do to help a reporter right now. This will go a long way in building a relationship with a reporter and they will remember it once this all calms down. Um, next slide. Show value. This is something we should always be doing when we're dealing with the press. It should not be promotional. It should not be an advertisement. And it should not be, we're so great. Um, but offer information that is relevant and um, look forward. Um, so for example, Margulies Peruzzi just did a survey. Um, they had 500 respondents talking about what they think, what they're thinking about when they need to come back to work. What is the workplace going to look like? Um, how are people going to handle social distancing? How are they gonna handle cleaning? And they polled a number of people and they got 500 respondents. So we are sharing that information with the press because that's people on the ground, running companies, managing companies, facility managers saying, this is what we're thinking about. Those are the types of things that the press are looking for right now. What are we doing right now? And then what are we doing about recovery? What are we doing to plan for when we all start to come back? Um, next slide, please. The biggest issue for, uh, the biggest question that I've had from people is, should we stop all of our PR and marketing? And my answer is no. Um, once you stop completely, it is very hard to restart. The other thing you need to keep in mind is that monthly publications have a three to six month lead time. So even if you're pitching right now, it's not going to appear for three to six months. So if you stop right now, you're, there's gonna be a big hole in three to six months and you're just not gonna have anything right then and there. The better thing to do is to, to have some consistent news going out, making sure that it's relevant, but keeping yourself visible. Um, there's always, you can do things on social media. I've seen a lot of things where companies are posting um, pictures of, uh, virtual happy hours, or they're posting pictures of how their people have set up their home office, 
or if you um, don't have kids at home, but your new coworker is your dog, they're posting pictures of their dogs. So they're finding ways to engage with their audience in a fun and light way because that's something that we all need right now. So leverage your social media to stay present and visible. And think about your email marketing. When this all first started happening, I had a client email me and say, should we put out an email blast to our clients saying that we're taking these steps to make sure our workers are safe and that we're still operating and everyone can work from home? And I said, no. I said, unless there's something specific you have to communicate to your clients, everybody is working from home. Everybody has remote workers. Everybody is making sure their workers are safe. So don't add to the clutter. But I will say I got a very clever email last week from Burns Engineering. And it was an email that talked about how if you are home and cooking and run out of materials to cook with. So for example, if you run out of butter, what can you replace? What can you use instead of butter in a recipe? And they had eight or 10 items. Um, and I thought that was very clever because we are all stuck at home. You can't just run out to the supermarket to pick up what you want. And so it showed some creativity and it was a good way to engage. And I don't even know how I got on their mailing list, but I've mentioned this to a number of people, how clever I thought this email was. Uh, next slide, please. Another thing is, if you think about it, as a marketing person, our to-do list is never ending. Um, there are so many things that we want to get to that we don't get to. And this could be updating project sheets, um, updating specific sections of our website, mapping out a new website, mapping out new materials, updating resumes, updating proposal text, um, um, changing out the graphics on our social media platforms. So some people are very busy right now and some people have time on their hands. So check in with your employees and find out if people have time on their hands, ask them to help. Have them write up um, a description of a project, a 15 to 100 word pro, um, description that you can use for a project sheet, you can use on your website, you can use for PR and marketing. Um, go through your website, make sure all the links work, make sure all the content is correct. Check out the bios of all of your employees. Are they up to date? Look at your resumes. So now is a time to take a look at all those things that you didn't have time to get to before and work through the list. Uh, you can also interview people uh, for topics that can be used for blogs, um, articles that can be written, um, abstracts for submitting for conferences. Um, you can also use some of this time and engage with your staff to show the value of marketing by holding some virtual training sessions. Uh, we recently, a client helped them update their individual LinkedIn profiles where we got on the phone with each person and walked through their LinkedIn profile and made sure that it was up to date and that everything, um, uh, they had the correct uh, information about the company, the correct logo, et cetera. You could do that right now. You could do a social media 101 and have a presentation like this one where you talk to your staff about your different platforms, what the messaging should be, how they should be used, why it's important for them to like and share, why it's important for them to help you come up with ideas for social media. So it's a way for you to show your value during this time. Uh, next slide, please. This is our number one rule, COVID or no COVID. Never ever lie to a reporter. Don't say in the subject line or in your email that, the, um, that what you're talking about is related to COVID if it's not. Um, they will remember and you will have burned a bridge with that reporter. They are getting bombarded with information about COVID. They need to know that they are getting accurate information from us. This is how you build a relationship with a reporter. So just don't lie. Uh, next slide, please. The second half of this presentation, if we have time, um, is all about um, interviews, press interviews, how to prepare for them, how to handle difficult questions and everything like that. Um, but we wanted to make sure that um, we got through the main part of the presentation and answered all of your questions. So we set that aside as a separate section. Nowadays, um, you know, it used to be that if you set up a phone interview for your president, you could be in the room with them, you could talk to them beforehand, you get on the speaker phone, um, or if you were doing it by video conference, you were in a conference room, you had IT support, you had other people there who could help out. 
Now everybody is at home. And as you saw today, there are technical difficulties. Before this webinar, I was on a call with a client, with their client in the UK, and we tried Skype business and that didn't work, so we closed it. And then we tried Microsoft Teams and that did work, but some people's audio worked and some people didn't. So before you put anyone on the phone with a reporter or anyone on a video call like this with a reporter, make sure you do a dry run. Um, because you want some people have given up their landline. So all they have is a cell phone. Do they have strong service where they are? Uh, not every town does. Um, I sometimes, I, before I switch to, to, to Comcast or to AT&T, um, if I would move my cell phone from one ear to the other ear, I would hang up with people. So make sure that you're testing this. Do a dry run. Have your spokesperson sit in their home office um, on the phone with you and maybe another person, because if you're trying a conference call bridge, you want to make sure it works. If you're doing video, get them on the video. Check the lighting. Check the background. Um, give them some tips and tricks. There are a lot of articles out there that have come out since everybody went home about the best way to set up for Zoom. You can get a background. You can, um, there's tips about what to wear. There's tips about how to position the lighting. Um, there's all sorts of things like that, what tools to use. Um, but make sure you're doing a dry run because the last thing you want is that you're trying to do a video call with a reporter and you have technical difficulties and have to log off shut down, try to get back on. The reporters don't have a lot of time, so you wanna make sure that you're using it as effectively as possible. Uh, next slide, please. There are also, um, like anything, out of any crisis, there comes new opportunities. Um, so I've listed a couple here. The Boston Business Journal normally has a section called Out of the Office, and what they do with that is they cover uh, work events. So they cover, um, you know, if a company has made a donation, if a company is volunteering at Habitat for Humanity, if there's an awards gala or an event or something. Well, obviously no one's going anywhere these days. So they switched it up and they changed it to working at home. And they are now accepting submissions of photos of people working from home. Um, it, some of them get run in the actual print edition and the rest are posted online. Uh, the Boston Globe has a column, they've actually taken the back page of one section, I believe it's the back page of the Metro section, and it's all positive good news. There's a section called Daily Distractions, which is ideas about things that you can do to get your mind off being stuck at home. Um, there's Acts of Kindness, which is where they're out there looking for people who are making a difference. And the first one that I saw um, was where a man in Salem had purchased $1,000 worth of gift cards from local businesses to show his support, and then he was handing them out to people um, along, uh, just during his day, you know, the grocery store worker, the mail carrier, et cetera. Um, so there's ways like that to highlight if anyone in your company is doing something like that, or just even one of your neighbors or you or something. Um, Wall Street Journal has Making It Work. It's a daily column. Um, they're featuring different people in different professions and about how they are adapting and adjusting to working during the pandemic. They featured um, a financial planner, um, a grocery store worker, a physical therapist. So there's opportunities. And High Profile Monthly actually has um, a COVID-19 special section on their website. Um, so you can go there to see um, what AEC firms are doing in the battle against COVID, and you can submit your news there as well. Uh, Susan, I, I just want to interrupt. We have a question. Um, what are your thoughts on sending out regularly scheduled e-newsletters if they don't include COVID content? I think by now, and I think that's a great question because I think by now, um, people are eager to hear about things besides COVID. Um, so, but just make sure you go through it and make sure that there, there, um, there isn't anything in there that might be seen as tone deaf. So for example, um, and let's say that, for example, you just moved into a new office and you have a workbench situation where people are all sitting right next to each other and you have collaboration rooms and everything like that. That's not really appropriate right now because we're not sure how we're going to come back to a workspace. How are we going to keep six feet apart until this whole thing blows over and we have a vaccine 
uh, and we have herd immu immunity. So just go back and take a look at it through the lens of COVID and maybe ask one or two people to look at it and say, does this sound tone deaf? Do we, do we show that we appreciate the situation, but at the same time, we still have news to share? So that's a great question. Uh, and we can go to the next slide. So um, we're about halfway through, so we just wanted to stop and see, does anyone have any more questions that they wanna ask about the first half of the presentation? If not, we'll move on to media training. Uh, I don't see any additional questions in the chat or the Q&A. So okay. uh, we've got about, uh, th we're 30 minutes in, so we've got 30 minutes left. All right, so, um, and we did wanna leave some time at the end for the Q&A, so. Yes. Um, but again, stop me if any of this, if you, if you have any questions. So we can go to the next slide. What we're gonna do here is go through some do's and don'ts. Um, so um, when you're dealing with the media, make sure, you probably already have identified a spokesperson. It's probably the head of your firm. Um, but if you're talking about a specific project, it might be a project executive. So for example, in Boston, the mayor put a um, uh, shut down construction in Boston, except for essential job sites. They are now talking about lifting that ban as long as there are certain safety procedures being taken. Um, and for example, one of them is that there has to be a medical professional on site or someone who um, is checking temperatures. So that when people come on site, you're checking to make sure that they are not running a temperature. So if um, you are reopening a job site and a reporter wants to talk to you, you should determine who is the best person to answer that question. It might be um, you know, your head of safety. It might be the president of your firm. It all depends upon the size of your firm. But you should identify different situations, different things that you're putting out there to the press and make sure that you know who is the spokesperson for that particular topic? So for example, a couple weeks ago, or maybe just last week, I've lost track of time like everybody else, um, Gil Bain and SLAM put out a press release about renovating um, a healthcare facility downtown to, how, to um, how, how, house home, uh, homeless people that have COVID. So it was a quick turnaround. It was done for DCAM. It's considered essential construction. We put out a press release about it and it got really good pickup. And before we put it out, I make sure um, to find out who should the spokesperson be so that if someone followed up with me that I knew exactly who I was supposed to be calling. And you make sure that person knows when the press release is going out or when the, uh, you're pitching the story so that they are available. I know everyone is stuck at home right now so you don't have to worry about them being on vacation or something like that. But keep in mind that a lot of people have kids at home, they're trying to juggle with their partner, who's taking care of the kids, who's working, who's not working. So just be respectful of that and make sure that you know who the spokesperson is so you're not scrambling if a reporter wants to speak to you or your company. If someone does contact you from the press, make sure you get back to them as quickly as possible. My first question is always, what is your deadline? Because if it's something that needs to be done by the end of that business day, I need to know that so that I can quickly call someone and get them on the phone. If you have a couple of days, then you have a little more time to find out the right person and to arrange a call or a video call or something like that. Um, always answer truthfully. Like we talked about earlier, never lie. And um, in a couple of slides, we're gonna talk about if you get a question that you don't know how to answer, how to answer it. Um, and keep in mind that reporters are doing their job. Um, free press is very important. We need people out there who are looking into things for us. They're covering all of these stories. Um, you know, I still get a physical new newspaper every day and I read it cover to cover. Um, they're just doing their job. So just be respectful, understand they're under a lot of pressure right now. So if they're, they're curt in their emails or they're curt on the phone, cut them some slack. Uh, next slide, please. So these are some of the don'ts. Um, if someone contacts you, don't try to talk them out of writing the story. 
Um, if they're writing about something that might have a negative impact on your company, then it's even more important than ever that you are talking to them and that you have a say in the story, that you have a say in crafting the story about your company. Um, don't refuse to answer. Don't just say, nope, I'm not gonna answer that question. No comment, don't answer. You know, By hiding, I mean, you just don't call them back. Um, how many times have you read an article where they said, we reached out and no one got back to us? Um, basically, it makes you look like you've done something wrong or you're guilty if you don't at least respond. And again, don't lie. Sorry, I say that a lot. Um, next slide. So if you're preparing a spokesperson for an interview, um, you've already done your homework, I hope, because you pitched the story. So you have information about that publication. Make sure you share that with the spokesperson. Let them know who's the audience, who reads this publication. Don't assume that they know. Don't assume that they know who reads High Profile Monthly. Don't assume they know who reads Banker and Tradesman. Uh, don't assume they know who reads uh, Building Design and Construction. So you should have that information to say, this is the audience, these are the people that you are talking to when you are talking to this reporter. Um, if you are issuing a statement because you're dealing with a crisis or because you feel more comfortable with a written statement to the press, make sure it covers all of the main five points. So that's who, what, where, when, why. Um, and then I always try to include in there, you know, who cares? Like, so make sure that you're showing um, that you understand the situation and you're responding to it as best as you can. Most reporters will want to get somebody on the phone, but sometimes they will send you over questions that you can respond to. You can also sometimes request the questions in advance. Uh, they may not send them, but you can always ask. And one thing that I will mention is that a lot of times when I have a client on the phone with a reporter, at the end of it, they'll say, thank you very much. Uh, when can I see a copy of it? Can I see a copy of it before, it come, before you publish it? Nine out of 10, 10 times, the answer to that question is no. Um, they're not gonna be able to send the article to all the people they interviewed before they publish it. They've gotta write that article, they've gotta get it to their editor, and they've gotta submit it for publication. Now, the, there's an exception to that, is if you're talking about something super, super technical. You know, the Mordan are talking about the vaccine and cell technology and how it's going to attack the coronavirus and everything like that. That's super technical. So they might say, can I write something up and have you to review it to make sure that it's accurate? But they would only send you that portion to look at. And that doesn't happen very often. So just, just be aware of that. Um, the other thing I should mention is that just because you're interviewed doesn't mean you're going to be included in the article. Um, so I had a, a small construction company that actually did apply for PPP. And they did talk to the reporter at the BBJ and she did not include them. And that's okay, that happens. Um, so just remember that there are no guarantees in PR. If you want guaranteed coverage in a publication, you should buy an ad, because that way it's your space and you can say whatever you want. Uh, next slide, please. When you are talking to the press, assume everything you say is on the record. I know we see movies and on TV that they, you know, there's some hard-boiled detective is talking to a reporter and they say, is this off the record? And then they always say, yes, no, just assume it is not off the record to be safe. So anything you say, anything you provide to a reporter, they can use. So make sure that you're, you, you're careful. And this is why sometimes it's helpful to do a dry run not just for the video conferencing capabilities, but to do a dry run with your spokesperson to talk through what the reporter is covering, what you think the key points are that you want to make on behalf of your company. You can even write up some talking points in front of you. There's nothing wrong with that. That's called being prepared. When you are on the phone with a reporter, um, and nowadays with video conferencing, it, it applies just as much. I'm sure we've all been on video conferences where six people start come talking at the same time and all the boxes start lighting up. Um, listen carefully to the question that the reporter is asking and make sure that they're done asking the question. It might be a two part question. And if you start talking too soon, you might have missed the second part of the question. Or there might be, you know, he might, the reporter might be kind of thinking, okay, well, I wanna ask this and is not quite sure how to ask it. And so it's kind of thinking out loud. 
you wanna make sure that you give them a chance to ask the full question. So wait for them to come to a full stop, maybe even pause for a beat before you start to respond to the question. Um, it drives me absolutely crazy when I'm on interviews and people start talking over the reporter. It just doesn't seem very respectful to me. While you're on an interview, if your spokesperson is not used to this, especially on video, tell them to breathe, tell them they can take their time, have a sip of water, gives them a chance to collect their thoughts, gives them a chance to, to just you know, decompress a little bit. It can be very stressful to be interviewed if you're not used to it. And then answer one question at a time. Um, we're gonna talk about this in a little bit, but if they throw multiple questions at you, it can be confusing and you're not sure which one to answer. Um, just answer one question at a time. Um, and we'll talk in a little bit. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, so again, um, this first part is about making sure that you read, do your homework, read articles by the reporter so you know what sort of things they normally cover. Obviously, in today's day and age, you might search on a reporter and it turns out they're, they're covering medical centers when they've never covered medical um, healthcare before. So looking at their past articles gives you a good sense because if they have suddenly been assigned to cover um, COVID and that's not normally their beat, then that gives you some insight into that they're not normally a healthcare reporter. So it's your job to educate them. It's your job to help them understand what's going on so they can write the best article. Um, some of the bigger articles that we're seeing in the paper have multiple people working on them because it's more of um, almost like a collage story about what's going on. And it's such a big and broad story that one person can't cover it. So they have multiple people contributing. And so it's good for you to understand what that person normally covers so that you're prepared when you get on the phone. And um, like any industry, our industry has a ton of jargon. We use acronyms, we use shortening, you know, short little words and statements that only mean something to us. So be very careful when you're, when you're talking to the reporter to make sure that you are um, spelling things out. So instead of saying HPM, say high profile monthly. Um, instead of saying ACEC, American Council of Engineering Companies. Don't assume that they know what the acronyms mean. Most of them will ask you if they don't understand what you're talking about. Um, but in PR, I know we have our own lingo and you have to be careful of not using that internal lingo when you're talking with a reporter because you want them to fully understand what you're talking about. And so you need to really explain everything that you're saying and not use jargon or slang or anything like that. Um, and know your facts. This is where the preparation comes in. And again, getting together with your spokesperson before you get on a call is not a bad idea. Um, if the reporter has sent over the points that they're looking to cover, you can map out exactly what you want to be saying. Next slide. So here what we're going to do is we're going to go through a couple um, real situations that, that might come up as you're, you're dealing with the press. So sometimes we call this the machine gun reporter where they fire three or four questions at you all at once. Now, to be fair, if you've ever watched a live press conference, you'll see that the, the reporters are all shouting questions and the person at the podium, like when Governor Baker does his daily thing, he always talks to one person. So one question at a time, but they're throwing all of those questions out at him. So when that happens to you, you can stop and say, okay, that's a lot. Can, can you back up? Um, what was that first question? And then answer that question and see if then they ask the second, third, or fourth question. Because sometimes it's done because they've got so many thoughts in their head, they're rushing. Sometimes it's because they're trying to confuse you and they want to get other information. Um, next slide, please. If you don't understand the question, ask for clarification. So are you asking me about you know, who's going to be doing the temperature takes? Are you asking how we're taking the temperatures? You know, if it's going to be one of those automatic ones or if we're going to have something, you know, where they have to put it in their mouth. Um, clarify, ask them what the question really is so that you are answering the question that, they, that they're looking for an answer to. Um, it's also a good way to give yourself some time to think if you need a break. So, all right. 
Um, all right, so I see that there's another question. How transparent should you be with your customers about the state of your business? Um, this is a, it's a good question. And this is a question that is really up to your company. Um, during the downturn of 2008, some companies were very honest about, you know, we had to lay off 50% of our staff. Uh, we've had to downsize, we've had to pull back. Um, I think in today's day and age, everybody is being impacted. And so everybody has, is, I mean, I know there's a thing going around about how we're not all in the same boat, but we are, we're all in the same storm and we're all facing an uncertain economic future. Um, so I think this is a time that your company needs to come together and decide how much information are you going to be sharing. The one thing I will say is that internal communications right now is more important than ever before. Make sure that you're communicating on a regular basis with your employees, whether it is, um, depending on the size of your company, um, a video chat, it could simply be, um, where you record a video by your president or CEO and send the link of the recording around to people so that they can hear directly from your leader. Um, it could be um, email updates. It could be um, group voicemails if everyone has access to their work phone from home. Um, but the main thing is you wanna be communicating with your employees because right now everyone is very unsettled. Uh, some people have been laid off. Some people have been furloughed, which means that they, they aren't going into work for two or three months. They're collecting unemployment, but they should have a job waiting for them at the end of that period. Um, some companies have applied and received funding from PPP. And if you have, you have to use it within two months um, to bring people back on the payroll. So employees have a lot of questions. On the flip side, I would say that as an employee of a company, um, again, just like we were talking about with the, with the press, um, be patient, be kind, and check in on both your coworkers, your manager, and your leadership. Um, this is a difficult time for everybody. And just because you're in the C-suite or you're at the top of the company doesn't mean that you're facing any less stress than everybody else. Um, no one knows what is going to happen with the economy. No one knows what's going to happen with a vaccine. We're all just doing the best we can to get through day by day. So communication now is more important than ever. So you, as, a, as the marketing person in your firm, as a professional communicator, make sure that you are reminding your leadership that you need to communicate with employees and then remind your fellow coworkers that everybody is in the same boat and that you should also be checking in on your managers. Just because they're a manager doesn't mean that they have any less stress than the rest of us. So that was a really good question, thank you. Uh, next slide. So this happens, especially during a crisis where they ask you a question and you don't wanna answer it or you don't know how to answer it or you don't have the information. So depending upon the situation, if it's you don't have the information, there's nothing wrong with saying, I don't know the answer to that question, let me get back to you. And then just make sure that you do get back to them. If it's a question that you would rather not answer, that is something that hopefully during your preparation for the interview, you've kind of mapped out what are some of the tough questions that might be asked and you have a prepared answer so that you can say, um, if you go to the next slide, please. So you can say, I'm sorry, but that's confidential information. Um, so for example, um, during a crisis, um, there might have been a workplace accident, there might have been um, a fatality, there might have been something that went wrong. OSHA has to investigate. So for you to speculate about what happened is premature. So there's nothing wrong with saying, we're still investigating, OSHA is investigating, we're not sure exactly what happened, we're trying to get to the bottom of it. The main thing about it is that you're being sincere and that you're not lying. And if you can't answer the question, a lot of times you can say, well, you know, um, from a legal perspective, I'm not allowed to comment. Um, and if it's something that has to do with, not with your company, but maybe another company or something, don't answer on their behalf. Just say, I can't answer for them. You're gonna have to talk to them. 
Um, it should come directly from the source. Um, and again, if you don't know the answer, there's nothing wrong with saying, I don't know the answer, but let me get back to you. Um, and then do, because they may be waiting for that piece of information for their story, they may not, but at least you're showing that you're responsive and you follow up and that's gonna build a relationship with that reporter. Uh, last one. So you've done all of this and I see we have another question. Um, so we, um, you get through all of this, circle back with the reporter and say, thank you very much for taking the time to, to speak with Joe. Um, if you need anything else, please let me know. If you need photos, if you need additional sources, et cetera, et cetera. It's just a way of circling back. Um, sometimes, um, you know, reporters are human, just like the rest of us, and sometimes there are inaccuracies. Um, I had this happen with an article that came out on Sunday. I contacted the, the reporter on Monday, asked him to make two corrections. They immediately made them online. That's the advantage of having um, most publications online these days. Um, it just do it in a respectful manner. Um, I sent an email and I said, thank you very much for taking the time to interview my client. Unfortunately, there were two things in the article that were not correct. We'd like to have those corrected if you have a chance. Um, an hour later, it was fixed and I was able to send the updated link to my client. Um, so if it's, if it's inaccuracies or, you know, things like that, they can fix it. If they directly quote your client, your spokesperson, and you don't like the way that it came out, um, that might be a sign that your spokesperson needs a little more media training. And then when it's all done, kick back, relax, and wait for the coverage to come out. So, um, does anyone have any questions? If not, we'll turn it over to Anastasia. Yeah. <laughs> that was actually, that was awesome. Thank you so much. I was actually um, uh, hoping that we could open it up for discussion. We have about 10 minutes left. I'm assuming um, that people that don't, don't want to see each other uh, or don't want us to see them can uh, turn their video off or even mute themselves. Um, so we have no, if, if it looks like we have no questions or chats, um, thank you, Susan. That was really, really informative and um, awesome. And I thought it was funny, especially when you said, make sure you do a dry run because <laughs> we did do a dry run a full hour yesterday. So, um, but I like to think that, uh, like you said, if we, if we heard your dogs bark in the background, Susan, then imperfection uh, would um, play a part in all of us working from home. We're, you know, we're all going to end up like that, uh, that video clip of the BBC reporter with his kids come flying in the background. So we just got to accept it. This is life. Life is messy. So, so um, we have a fun little game that I thought we could play. And it's called Odd Man Out. And uh, normally we would have a mariachi band play the theme song, but unfortunately they're out of work at the moment. So I'll sing the theme song. It goes Odd Man Out. So according to an article on themuse.com, there are three perks to working from home. And I'm gonna name three of them, and it's up to you to answer which perk is the odd man out. So this is, and if you answer correctly, you will get a full, the full digital album of the new Fiona Apple uh, album, okay? So okay. is it A, you can work in your pajamas? B, you'll never miss a FedEx again, or C, you get a glimpse of your neighbor walking around nude. Oh, and what was the question again? Wh which is the odd man out? What is the perk of working, uh, what, what would not be a perk working from home? You get Number three, the nude neighbor. That's, well, that's, a, that's all relative. <laughs> all right, congratulations, you get the new Fiona Apple album. I'll send it to you, to you digitally. Um, I want to thank everyone for um, joining our webinar. This was, uh, and, and thank you for your patience in the beginning. And um, I don't know if we can see everyone. I was hoping to make like a conversation, but. Can and you I see? wanted to say if at any time anyone has questions, the last slide has my email address. Um, if you have questions, if anything comes up, don't hesitate to contact me. I'm happy to answer any questions that I can. I know it can be a little intimidating on a video call. Um, but uh, do not hesitate to ask. Um, we all got to stick together in this. We do, we do. And, um, and actually, yeah, Susan, it's, 
it's just S Shelby at rhinopr.com, correct? Susan at rhinopr.com. Susan at rhinopr.com. <laughs> um, and uh, guys, if you tune in next week or not tune in, but if you join next week, we have Nancy Greenwald of the Construction Institute discussing um, how to make decisions in a crisis. So that'll be really interesting. But um, if anyone's interested in sponsoring the webinar, email info at high-profile.com, info at h-i-g-h-profile.com. And um, well, we have three, three, uh, three things. Nope. Oh, yep. Susan's info is right in the chat and her phone number and her cell and her office. So you can text her if you want. She loves text messages. <laughs> I'm just kidding. All right. Thanks very much, everyone. Have a good day. Stay safe, everyone. Thank you, Susan.